Welcome everybody to the podcast. This is Raj Karak. I'm your host from the morebusiness.com podcast and I'm really excited today to welcome Daniel Heimlich. Daniel is a consultant. He and I met, oh, gosh, must be a few years ago now, Daniel, um, yeah. in, in a room in one of uh, my prior companies when you right. were talking to one of my uh, colleagues. And next thing you know, we sort of hit it off and we've, <laughs> we really have a lot of synergy and Daniel is an expert on messaging. And so welcome to the podcast. Well, th thanks so much for uh, inviting me, Raj. Uh, it's great to be here. Yeah, you know, and I, we're going to cover some really important topics. You know, as we it, it, in running a business, you cover all kinds of things, you know, leadership, executive coaching, uh, motivation. But, you know, to get more business, you really have to have the right message. So we're going to talk about how to develop a strong marketing message for your brand. So let's open up really with, a, you know, what's an example of a weak message that you transformed into a strong message sure well one that uh, that comes to mind is um i had a, a client uh, just a just a few years ago and um they were trying to kind of make their way into more senior level executives they, their, their challenge which i see from a lot of tech companies in particular is that they're getting a lot of traction kind of with these lower level you know the techies the analysts the mm -hmm. viewers um and the people that actually are using the software um, but those are not the people that can write the checks. So no matter how much enthusiasm you've had, and I've seen a lot of false starts with companies because they get all this enthusiasm from kind of these lower level folks, they weren't able to get to these senior decision makers. So this company, we won't go into all the details about the company, um, really kind of techie stuff, but their message was, you know, automated firmware security analysis software, which, you know, by the way, if you're like a network engineer or run devices, I mean, that's meaningful to you. But frankly, if you're a chief information security officer or CEO, that doesn't mean a whole heck of a lot. Yeah. And, yeah. and the tendency, and I'm sure you've seen this, Raj, yourself, is that, you know, they would dive right into, and we all know that not to do this, but somehow it happens. They're diving into the features right away, talking about the product, you know, not just mm. not you know, not really talking about, you know, what's important to the client. So after a lot of research, um, what we did with this automated firmware security analysis software is our new opening was, hey, did you know that 25% of your connected devices are exploitable? So first Ooh, of all, everybody understands that. Everybody <laughs> understands that. Yeah. So, so it's like, and, and by the way, this was based on real research. Um, remarkably, mm -hmm. by the way, all these devices that are on these endpoints, mm -hmm. and I won't go into the details because it is fascinating, but 25% have exploitable vulnerabilities. Mm. I'm talking about um, every router. I'm talking about IoT devices, all those devices, and every device within a large enterprise actually has 25% of your connected devices. So yeah. do you think that maybe a CFO or a COO or CEO would be, would maybe maybe uh, step forward a little bit to, to hear what I have to say about that? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I, you know, I mean, it, what you that that line that you just transformed from, you know, I'm an electrical engineer. I loved my engineering days, but I, you know, it, and I have fun with my engineering colleagues. But at the end of the day, they don't write the checks. Right. <laughs> and you made such a big distinction that you really got to message it so that the people writing the checks understand why they need to budget for something. And the way you transform that line into, did you know? It's, it's one of those. Hey, you had me at hello. Yeah. I mean, that's the opening, right? And that the, when a salesperson uses something like that, it really makes a difference. And you're just like, whoa, whoa, I don't want to be one of those people that gets exploited, right? Mm -hmm. So just instantly you've made that connection. Um, and and so I, I want to unpack that because that is a really strong, yeah. that is a really strong message. So, so you talk about one, most messaging, especially from technology companies, tends to focus on features and it tends to focus on the wrong buyer actually doesn't even focus on the buyer focuses on the user right right and so um so when you come up with the messaging i mean like you know messaging is obviously very critical what are the steps how do you how do you go through figuring out um how to target it to the right person yeah that's a good question so so no, one is i just want to kind of point out that um messaging by the way has many different layers Hmm. Um, and, I, and we could talk about this a little bit later in the conversation, but I, would, I just want to say that that in and of itself is not the message. OK, okay. Um, so, so there's there's something I call I call it the core premise. I call that the core premise. And the idea here is that I want to create a message that my opening 
is the kind of thing, and it kind of gets the kind of response, frankly, that you it just even you are not even my prospect for that. But yeah. you get it and are shaking your nodding your head. You know, the yeah. core premise is like the thing that um, if you were in front of your ideal customer and you actually had a room of them, every single one of them would be literally nodding their head when you say it. That's when you know you have a good core premise. Mm. Or everyone's mm -hmm. laughing in the room because it's it, it just hits such a, a point for them that they're all chuckling all at one time. Um, yeah. Uh, well, you know, let me just pause you there for a second because what you said about everyone's chuckling in the room, what you've done is you've touched an emotion. And we know that people buy from their emotions. It can be the most techie oriented product and you could be working in a manufacturing plant and all they are about is just like business business but but the moment you touch their emotions and everybody has them as stern as they might look when you tap into that that's when you know you've got something so i appreciate you sharing that that's Thank a really you. important point yeah yeah I'm sorry, I took us off uh, off 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 your uh, off your question. What remind me again? No, well, let's let's go into why messaging is so critical. I like that you you've got the core message. Yeah, uh, you you got your core principle, and then what are the other layers to this? Yeah, so so in this case, you know, so we talked about kind of the core premise. Um, so in this case, remember it was firmware security analysis software. So what we did was we came up um, and coined this phrase, and it 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 it, and it and it already sounds familiar, even though you've never heard it, and it's called, we call it device vulnerability management software. So we mm -hmm. put them into a position, we position their, their company as device vulnerability management software. And the reason why that works, um, and again, not, not all of your uh, listeners are necessarily in, in this particular industry and security, but um, uh, software vulnerability management is a very popularized area. Um, huge investments have been made in software vulnerability management, and the same buyers of software vulnerability management would be interested in in, my, in this client's um, type of product. So, by actually attaching ourselves to something that's already been familiar, vulnerability management, software vulnerability management. Now we have device vulnerability management. So now that's the position, okay? And then we have what I call the value pillars, okay? So the value pillars um, being, and we could, and there's other elements of this also. I'm kind of fast tracking here. We can go into more detail around each of these elements. Um, but you know, um, in this case, it's you know reduces risk by securing the hundreds or thousands of vulnerable devices on your attack surface. You know, this client helps you know re reduce that. You know, automated firmware analysis. So the the firmware analysis is still in there, but now it's three levels lower um, in the message. Maybe that's the first message for you know for the user. But that's not. But that might be the third level message, if you will, for the buyer. And then mm -hmm. we have other messages as well. I, I won't bore you with all of it. But actually, the, the, you know, the good outcome about this because you asked me what was a weak message that transformed the company. Um, not only was the company able to be successful in transitioning, and by the way, helping their customer because they're internally in the organization. Um, these tech folks, they were having trouble translating this to their bosses. Mm. Um, Suddenly now the client is getting, you know, much better conversations, able to get to those senior level buyers. Um, we saw, you know, a significant uptick in pipeline and traction. And ultimately, um, you know, within a year actually of this project, uh, they were acquired by Microsoft. Look at that. Yeah. Wow. And I'm not and that was just the message alone, but, you know, yeah. it definitely was a contributor. Well, the message though drives whether someone's going to talk to you. So that drives sales. And I think that's one of the most overlooked part because I know all the, the companies that I've worked with in the past, that's one thing we struggle with is like, well, what is our messaging? And I like the way you've approached this because it's not like, okay, here's our one line. There's actually layers to it, right? So here's what we use in this situation. Here's what we use in that situation. And here's how we explain it um, in short words, longer words, that kind of thing. So is so so let's talk about the whole process because coming up with a message is hard. This is your expertise, Daniel, and I, I tell you, uh, it is a it is a tough nut to crack for some of these uh, very um, intricate pieces of software or or companies that do all kinds of complex things. And oftentimes, I hear people just kind of take the lazy route by saying, "Well, our stuff's too complex to explain in just a couple of words." Yeah. Uh, you know, is that really true? And um, I mean, what's the process? I, I, I would say that's never true. Yeah. Um, yeah. And it shouldn't be true. And if it's too complicated to understand and explain in a few words, yeah, you might want to be in another business. <laughs> because, <laughs> I mean, yeah. it's, um, it, 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 you might have a great product and you might have a good hobby there. Um, yeah. But if you actually want to create, you know, not just, um, you know, breaking into the early market, into the techies. And by the way, maybe you can get away with that. Um, with, you know, kind of, you know, if, you, if you're familiar with crossing the chasm and Jeffrey Moore, he talks yeah. a lot about 
mm -hmm. um, kind of the early adopters. So, you know, a lot of companies, as you know, Raj, I'm um, yourself said you're an engineering background. A lot of these companies are founded from engineers. They're founded from tech people, from product people. And great, they come yeah. up with great ideas. Um, and early on, they're able to sell to people like them with a complicated message because those people are willing to take the time to sit down and really understand it and understand all of that, you know, that stuff. But if you're going to ever get to the mainstream um, and get to the mainstream market, you have to get it to those those two or three or four words. You have to. And and honestly, um, my experience is it can it could always be done. Um, mm -hmm. That might not be the expertise, obviously, of that particular person, but there are marketing people out there um that are you know able to look at this through a different lens um to be able to get you there um so so you asked me a great question like what is the process um number one is um i like to create it's not just a message i actually think about it as a message map hmm. so it's a message map and think of a message map as being kind of a core document that actually has all the elements. We'll talk about these, and we could talk about these in a moment. Um, but you know, it really has all the elements of the message because the message is not just one thing. It's not just one line. That's not going to magically change your business. Um, mm -hmm. it, there is multiple layers here, um, as you said earlier. Um, and it, and so this messaging map is kind of the uh, it, it's kind of the central compass for your organization in terms of the message. It's the place you go back to um, in order to. Um, have your sales pitch in order to create your website, in order to create, um, you know, your sales materials, your presentations. Um, it creates consistency across your organization. Um, and that's kind of the purpose of the message. It's an internal document, um, mm -hmm. but it's the, it's the document you're going to go to um, that kind of is the, uh, the, the, the central point of truth. Um, and obviously that might change and evolve over time, um, but that's kind of where it lives in this message map. Well, so, let's let's go into it. Like, what what does a message map look like? I'm, I mean, I'm dying yeah, to know now. You right. teased me uh, enough here. <laughs> I keep moving on from the, from the last question, but um, yeah. but yeah. So the message map looks like um, basically it's you know, I mean, um, you know, it could be on. First of all, it, literally, it could be like in a word document, or you know, or it could be in a. Pre, a I usually create them in PowerPoint. Um, so number one, what it looks like is there's um, there's kind of a core premise. We talked about that. What that is developing the core premise. You know, kind of that. That central thing that all, that's going to make everyone head nod in your organization. It just gets to the pain mm -hmm. that is so deep that your your audience it's, and it's separate from you. It's separate from your company, but it aligns with your value proposition. And mm -hmm. it's so deep that they have to they have to agree with it. Mm -hmm. um, it's you're gonna. It's I think of it as kind of the high ground where you're going to come back to, um, no matter what, no matter what they say, because you're going to attack that problem. By the way, um, with you, you know. It's 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 an uh, universal truth. Mm -hmm. That's kind of the core premise. The second is the positioning. Um, so positioning is really you know this idea of um, you know what what is your product and how it's differentiated. Um, in fact, you know I mean messaging is kind of a broad term and it's important by the way to really separate, in my opinion, positioning from messaging. We we and, and I think those two become conflated um, when we talk about messaging. Mm -hmm. I think about positioning as being, you know, how you're different, how you're differentiated. Um, it's kind of the place that you own in the buyer's mind. That's really what positioning is. For example, um, Raj, if I said to you, you know, the number one, what's the world's number one luxury electric car company? Yeah, you would think Tesla. Right. So, I mean, that's positioning, right? It's the world's number one um, luxury electric car company. Or if I said to you, hey, what's the number one company in on-demand car transportation? Well, you would think Uber or Lyft. Right. Right. It has yeah. to be. And by the way, it's interesting. you didn't say a taxi company. You know, I know. <laughs> right. right. So their position yeah. is against taxi companies because it's an on-demand. That's the thing about positioning. It's creating context against the competition. Yeah. Um, interestingly, by the way, um, I, by the way, I'm kind of a non-linear conversationalist, but you already know that about me. So uh, we're, we're, we'll go in. A, I know we might go in a few different directions here, but um, so uh, interestingly, um, did you know what the Uber's original uh, company name was? No, it was Uber Taxi. Uber Taxi. Yeah, I didn't. Know I'm that. sorry. Or it was Uber Cab or Uber Taxi. It was Uber. okay. All right. Um, but I, I thought that was interesting, and I'm sure. I'm, I don't know. I didn't read this, but I, I suspect that. They didn't want to be aligned and the same. They didn't want to be in the same position as taxi cabs. 
Um, there and 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 I think we don't think of them as the same as taxi cabs. Um, they are. They have created their own category. I mean, yeah. obviously, Lyft is now a part of that, and I'm sure there may be others. Um, you know, so like, uh, so I, I, uh, there's a guy named Russell Bronson who created this company called ClickFunnels. And when you look at what the software is, it's basically marketing automation with landing pages. And so he didn't market it that way. He caused, he said, no, we're creating sales funnels for you. And he branded everything he did around funnels and sort of created his own category and really became a leader in that. So when people think software for funnels oh that's what it you know but honestly it's, it's, just, it's the same thing it's it's email marketing automation tied exactly. with with a landing page exactly. and so and really, uh, um you know if you remember hubspot did the same thing with inbound marketing mm -hmm. um, i mean they basically that was that was a a known phrase and what have you but they kind of took owner complete ownership of that inbound marketing and and now that is completely associated with them that's their they've expanded now beyond that um but the yeah. point is is that you know, the, the magic in being differentiated is not actually in the messaging. The messaging is really about explaining the value. Mm -hmm. the message explains the value. That's, you know, how we're better, um, how we're different, our unique value proposition. But the differentiation is the positioning. How am I different? Um, and, and I mean, I, I, and I keep, you know, uh, and I'm sorry, the viewers can't see me. But when I think about positioning, it's, I'm thinking about this narrow channel that I'm focusing mm -hmm. on and how mm -hmm. I'm separated from everything else. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. And this is all part of your message map, right? Yes, this is part of the message map. So you, we talked about the core premise and we have the positioning. Mm -hmm. um, then what we have is, I like to talk about it as the brand promise. Okay, so the brand promise, it's the ultimate promise to the end user. So let, actually, let, let me kind of give you a quick, a, quick, a quick little example here. This will be happening. So let's say our core premise is uh, riding and traffic sucks. Mm -hmm. We, can we, you think we could all kind of I think we up, all will that. agree that that's a thing. <laughs> so, right. Yeah. So, so imagining now my positioning was I had a company, let's call it the um, instant uh, teleporting. Okay, okay. was my company name. Um, and that's what the name of my product. So um, my positioning might be the world's first teleporting system for commuters. Okay, so that would be my positioning. By the way, that's not by the way, what am I positioning against? I'm not a bus. I'm not a, I'm not a me I'm not the metro. I'm not a taxi. I'm not a car. I'm the world's first teleporting system for commuters. Um, I'm still okay. Yeah. Um, brand promise is really the now the ultimate promise to the end user. Are you tracking with me here? Yeah. So, um, so it might be the ultimate brand promise might be you know commute from your home to your office in seconds. That's the ultimate promise to the end user, and that's really almost it, it begins to get to the emotion. To your point, mm -hmm. um, the emotion. It's like what is that going to mean to me? now as a user and what have you and that's where we get into the um this other component of the messaging map where i call it the value pillars okay the value pillars and these are the these are the things that we normally think of as being kind of the benefits and features actually people think about features and benefits i think about it as benefits and features you should start with your benefits and then talk about how your features are supporting those benefits don't start with just the features which yeah. a lot of techies tend to do so what I like to do for the value pillars, number one, is I like to come up with um, kind of an acronyms um, because my salespeople are going to be the people that are going to use these value pillars a lot. And it's very hard for me to stick an elevator pitch into somebody's head and for them to for me to expect for them to do that exactly. And candidly, a good salesperson is not is 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 they're, they're working very modularly. They're they're asking good questions. Um, they're uncovering what the pain point is. So if I have three value pillars, well, it might be value pillar number two that they want to focus on versus value pillar number one. So um, the elevator pitch might not fit that exact situation. So the value pillars are generally, I try, I try to keep it to three. Um, so let's say again, our uh, for our company here, instant tele teleporting, um, maybe the value pillars would be around safety, speed, and savings, okay? I'm sure mm -hmm. right away you're thinking teleporting, is that safe? Um, so, so, you know, safety would be number one, let's say speed might be number two and savings. And I, by the way, and, and I think of the, the messaging map, it's almost like peeling back an onion. Okay. Mm -hmm. so I have mm -hmm. this high level message around safety. Um, and maybe safety is going to be something around, um, you know, we were, uh, you know, developed by NASA and we have a five-star safety rating by consumer reports. Okay. Maybe that would be a, um, uh, you know, something I might use as supporting message around that. And then I might peel back the onion on that as, okay, now what are all the features that support that? Maybe it's my, my nano um, dispersion technology, you know, mm -hmm. that, you know, enabled that. 
Um, you know, it's like, you know, it's like, you know, you, you thought Star Trek was fake. That was actually all real. Um, we've been developing this for the last, you know, 60 years. Uh, I'm not sure. But, you know, you're peeling back the onion and getting into the depth of that message. And all of that depth and flavor and taste, if you will, of that message, that deep message. Yeah. Um, that's actually going to be used by all of your marketing people. It's going to be the support, you know, the materials. And by the way, this is not the elevator pitch. Again, you're going to, this is, you're going to create the sales tools from this. This is not the sales tool. This is a tool for internally. Um, so everyone's aligned. It's the kind of tool, by the way, you can hand off to your PR department. You can hand it to your graphic designers. You can hand it to your branding agency, your, your marketing people, and all of them are working from this. Um, so again, we have the value pillars. Um, again, Try to make it memorable if you can. I had one that um, was a client that was pro. Um, it was, you know, I, I can't remember now what it stands for exactly. You know, is uh, you know, professional, responsive, you know, organizational or whatever they, they had been. Um, and then, um, you know, again, you know, try to make these not just technical. You know, you you mentioned at the beginning, but making it emotional. You know, mm -hmm. I. I Everything, you know, maybe we should have mentioned this at the beginning, the work, at least that I do in, in my kind of uh, expertise really is in the B2B side. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. There might be some differences here in what we're talking about for consumer. Um, you know, branding is, is much more front and center and, you know, we don't need to get into all of that. But a lot of what we're talking about here and actually, frankly, all of the, all of the things that I'm talking about um, really are specified to business to business. But I like to say that business to business people, you know what? They're people too. <laughs> they have emotions. Um, you know, they have feelings. They want, are trying to get ahead in life. They have a family at home. They want time. They work, want life, you know, work life balance. Um, they want all those things, but you know, we tend to talk to them in very technical jargon, very matter of factly about things. Mm. But you need to be positioning and talking about your message and your value pillars in ways that are going to make them feel on an emotional level, like going back to our tele teleporting uh, product, you know, wow, you know, Raj, if I could, um, you know, you know, and if you believe, you know, that this was a safe system and I could teleport you um, from your home to your office in seconds and back the same way, what, what would that mean for you? Yeah, it would mean it would mean you could actually go to the office and it wouldn't matter where you're located and you can work anywhere and it just give you so much more flexibility to meet in person. Um, and, you know, it's really interesting because a lot of people get caught up in in looking at their product and saying, well, this industry could use it and that industry could use it and this group can use it. And they come up with 100 different types of use cases. And it just kind of goes nowhere because they can't make any sales because their messaging is all over the map. You're actually not able to reach people who, um, you know, you just have to pick. And that is one of the hardest things for a CEO who's been a technical founder. And I know because I've been there. I've done this myself. And uh, and you step in this pothole. You don't even know you're in a pothole. You're just thinking, no, I'm like going after this big market. And you're really not because what you're doing is you're spreading yourself so thin that your salespeople don't know how to sell it. That's you don't know how to sell it. You buyers. And the worst part is your buyers don't know what they're buying. They don't know how to buy. It. They don't know how to use it. And uh, so. A hundred yeah. thousand percent. In fact, I would actually yeah. say that is maybe the biggest issue that I see um, yeah. when I go into these organizations, I kind of call it like the Swiss army knife syndrome. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it's kind of like, if you think of your, if you, you know, and, and that's the problem is, especially for earlier stage companies, you know, they're, they're chasing the money. So every time there is, yeah. um, and I, I, I won't name them, but I, I've had a client, you know, every time they talk to a new, a new prospect, they're developing a whole new value proposition. They mm -hmm. literally are, they're having their marketing person come out literally with a new sales sheet. They literally mm. have, I'm not kidding, two or three dozen sales sheets. Yeah. Um, you know, there's no focus there at all. There's no repeatability. And I know that's hard as an early stage company, but you know, it's a Swiss army knife. You're trying to be all, you know, you're trying to be a blade, a scissor, and a saw yeah. at one time. And the, here's the yeah. thing, you need to be a blade, a scissor, or a saw. One, one of the, especially, especially as a, um, a smaller company, when I say smaller company, I'm talking about even under 50 million. 
Um, mm -hmm. you need to be a blade, a scissor, or a saw if you're following me on this. You need to be. I, I, I totally get what you're saying. I mean, I've seen so many companies thinking that, okay, I'm going to do this, that, and the other thing because we compete with this $1 billion company on this tiny little niche. Whereas that $1 billion company is busy just buying up other all kinds of companies to add to their roster. And next thing you know, you've spread yourself so thin because your sales team doesn't know how to sell it you've got you know all kinds of like pipeline issues because <laughs> your messaging is all over the map because you can't have and we struggled with this actually when you and i met i was you know with um uh one of my prior companies uh, which provided uh fundraising intelligence but well i should say wealth related intelligence and, and one of the primary markets was fundraising in, uh, institutions universities um, and also financial institutions because they also wanted to know wealth related data on, on stuff. But we actually had, I must be like 10 other niches that the company had, had gone after. And so, you know, when, when myself and, and some of the other um, newer executive team members were brought in, we trimmed that down to, I think, three or four that we could really service. And it was, you know, it was a large couple hundred so people. So three, company three or four kind of use cases. Correct. Yeah. Did, and so did, like those, did, did those, did those all fall under um, wealth intelligence? Yes. Yeah. By the way, and I, by the way, I love that um, because that is positioning. Okay. Yeah. It Let's made see. a big difference. It made a right. big difference because we were going after all these different niches. And again, our sales teams were just like scattered and, and it just helped us focus so much better, especially honestly in the financial services space, because the product that we had was a really tight fit for that space. We just, couldn't position it well because you know on our website when someone goes to visit it <laughs> they see all this confusing messaging there who is this for who can buy it so i think like gosh mike if there's a takeaway for um you know any entrepreneurs or cxos listening to this it's definitely focus on one specific niche market um Dan, i want to get back into like the exactly. process to create a message one right? last comment on that though because I, I think this yeah. is a really important area yeah um you know i the Companies, they like you said, they they tend to they have the Swiss Army knife. They they want to go everything. They're going everywhere at once. It's a big mess. Yeah. Um, you know, it's 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 such a challenge. And uh, I kind of lost my, my my train of thought now. Oh, um, that's okay. We'll, we'll get back to it. But I know that a lot of times companies like they think of like oh, we can do all this kind of stuff, but you really got to just like pick one. It is so hard to do. It is yeah. so hard to do. Uh oh, what, what I was gonna say is that you know we are in such a. I mean, more than first of all, this was always important. It has always been important, but it's so much more important today. We are in such a busy market. I mean, we all know this. I mean, I, I don't. I, I I think there's been some study about like we we literally get thousands of messages thrown at us every day in front of us mm -hmm. um, between you know Twitter and LinkedIn and Facebook and driving along the highway and you know mm -hmm. all these messages coming at us. All and we're overwhelmed with information. We are in we are in the thick of the information age here. Um, yeah. We're overwhelmed with it. So if you're not specializing, um, there's no, it's especially as an earlier stage, you know, company, a smaller company, there's no way that you can compete. I, I have um, a client that, for example, um, they have a case management uh, product, case management software product. Um, guess mm -hmm. what? ServiceNow does case management software. Um, mm -hmm. it, you know, going head to head against, you know, salesforce.com and, 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 uh, and, and, and by the way, so it's, arguably salesforce.com also has case management software mm -hmm. it's all case management software but it's really different applications of case management software so you know we went really super narrow um, um and we get, we actually came up with basically two particular use cases to your point one is around um insider threat case management super niche but no one is addressing that. It's a huge issue for big enterprises, and we are getting remarkable traction around this. And, and the company has become known as an expert now in, in basically because there are special security standards that are required for these types of people. And the other area is um, cybersecurity case management um, because, um, because a lot of these types of incidents for cybersecurity or for um, insider threat need to be separated from a, from a product like ServiceNow or Salesforce. So, so go, you know, they could have very easily tried to go head to head. Mm -hmm. There's no point in it. You're not going to overcome these Goliaths, yeah. Uh, unless you are have just an unbelievable amount of funding, and that's not the case in, in most of these. Yeah, and when you go, when you focus, you can really understand your customers' needs significantly better, which ties right into the messaging. Yeah, right into the messaging, and that's why I think that's so uh, so important for your focus. 
Um, so I like the that whole idea of the message map. Let's keep on that thread there for a second. So what's the rest of the process to actually come up with messages? That's, I think, yeah. gosh, you know, especially for a nerdy engineer like me, sometimes that's really hard to come up with. You know, never had any business background, formal education or anything like that. So it's really... Um, yeah, half the time you're going by gut, but what would a pro, you're the pro, man. Tell me, how do you come up with um, the steps to create a message? Well, num number one is, um, you know, you need to identify what your ideal customer profile is. Mm -hmm. um, you, you can't, you can't, you can't start developing your message just sitting around a table um, inside your office. <laughs> you yeah. know, it's, it, it, you know, it, you have to start, you, you have to identify the need. Um, at the end of the day, I mean, look, at the end of the day, honestly, it's kind of really simple. I, I don't want to give it away to everybody, but, you know, it's like find a need, develop a product that attaches to that need, <laughs> and yeah. then create a message that is going to um, attract that that buyer. Um, so, you know, I, identify that ideal customer profile. Um, you know, hopefully you already have this. Hopefully you actually built the product because it started with the ideal customer profile. The fact of the matter is, um, you know, a lot of products actually get built because um, they saw a use case, but maybe the market isn't as large as the, what they had originally thought. Or I actually have other clients where um, they've had a great run, um, but now they now, def now they have to have, a, things have changed. They have new competition, so they have to identify a new type of buyer. But you need to figure out who is that buyer, the people that are going to nod their head at that core premise, or you need mm -hmm. to develop that core premise around that buyer um and understand their pain points do the research i mean i know this is kind of well I, I think it's fun but you know it's the hard work um it's not the sexy you know marketing spin on stuff it's do the research talk to customers um research your competitors go really deep how are people talking go to um chat you know go look on chats on um on you know on you know on on various chat channels and what have you see what people say and actually something i learned from you raj is do SEO searches. Um, yeah, you know, pretty I, I, yeah. Maybe, maybe you can mention that because I always just thought yeah. of SEO tools as being like just for my website. Yeah. But it's become a very powerful tool for me, thanks to you, by the way, because you pointed this out to me about how yeah. you can do that for your marketing research. Yeah, I use SEO for market research all the time. It's one of the most underutilized use cases for these um, these SEO uh, keyword research tools is to, to see, like, is there a market for messaging something a certain way? Because quite frankly, these tools will practically tell you what the message is. They'll tell you this is what people are searching on. More people are searching for these types of words as opposed to these types of words. So you can do all the guesswork you want, but the data, when it's staring you in the face, makes your job a lot easier. So I think there's definitely um, definitely a lot to that. Let's talk about let's talk about some of the challenges that people have when they come up with messaging. So one of them we talked about was focus. I mean, my God, that's probably like the biggest gorilla in the room. But what are the other stumbling blocks, the oversights, the mistakes that companies make? Well, actually, what, what, actually, just to kind of um, and this ties right into what your last comment was is a lot of times what I find is organizations try to be too different. They try mm -hmm. to be too different. They're not grounded in reality. Um, and what, you know, so it's nice. And, and by the way, frankly, I kind of learned the lesson on this myself a few times, um, especially earlier in my career, because I wanted to come up with something that didn't sound like anyone else that was so differentiated and unique. And guess what? Nobody really understood what the heck I was talking about. Yeah, <laughs> It needs to be grounded, you know. Um, and so, you know, for example, you know, um, do you know what the, you know, you know what they first called the uh, the first the first automobile? Well, it wasn't a car, right? Right. And what, why was that? Because they wouldn't call it a car because, you know, what does that mean? Yeah. Um, it doesn't, yeah. There's no category. <laughs> right. So, they didn't yeah. call it an automobile. Um, they actually called it the horseless carriage, right? Yeah. Because there were horse-drawn carriages back then. They called mm -hmm. it the horseless carriage. So yeah. they took kind of a an idea that was grounded in truth, okay, and that people, everyone understood what a horseless carriage was. Yeah. Um, and then they um, they actually you know were able to position it. That's positioning horseless carriage. By the way, I literally just had an epiphany just now when you said the word car. Mm -hmm. you, and maybe you know this, this is this dumb of me. I bet the word car probably comes from carriage. Oh, 
that's a good point. Very. <laughs> I, I didn't put that, that together that either. Second. We'll have to look that up after the uh, after that's the. Call. A, that's a that's a good like uh, trivia question for a beer game. I love that. <laughs> so, but, but you need to. You need to. You know, I had a I had one client that is a software testing company. Okay. By the way, has hundreds of customers, but with but they themselves internally were getting bored with testing. By the way, that's one of the problems is we get bored with our own story faster than the market. Yeah. So yeah. Uh, he didn't, he re, he literally, when I started working with them, they didn't have the word testing on their website. They didn't want to call them. They didn't, they want to be so different. They wouldn't use the word testing. Listen, you, you can't, mm -hmm. uh, you know, and by the way, I use the SEO tool. I, that's actually how I showed them. This is what pe people are, are searching on this. Yes, yeah. you need to differentiate and distinguish yourself. But you have to ground it in truth. So that's a big, a big mistake that people make is trying yeah. to be too different. Um, yeah, you know, and th so that's like so. You know, I see these. Um, I just think it's complete nonsense when I see it. Is people say, "Oh, sales funnels are dead. Oh, this, that, and the other thing is dead." And what they're trying to do is, like you pointed out, they're just trying to carve out some kind of niche for everybody. And what's happening is they're just confusing people. Well, wait. You're really the same thing. You're just calling yourself something different. How? I mean, like when you look under the covers, there's no difference. Yeah. <laughs> so, oh, so, I mean, and, and that is part of the magic of marketing, right? Yeah. Is, is, your, is you know that's kind of the thing that you know people like me are. We're, we're trying to create a new vision for things. Mm -hmm, uh, mm -hmm. Trying to you know sometimes uh, put lipstick on an old pig. Yeah. Uh, you know, but yeah. you know sometimes we're faced with that. But you know, but fortunately, you know, especially a lot of the people I'm sure that are listening to uh, to this, and I'm seeing it a lot. You know, with my clients, is that there are some really unique and differentiated um, products, yeah. um, really exciting technologies. Um, but even there, you have to kind of ground it in truth. You have to ground it to that core premise, what people understand. Um, to, and you have to use that as the foundation to build your message from. Um, you know, another area, um, we talked about not being focused. That's a, that's a huge one as well. Um, probably, like we said, like the number one. You know, but another area of messaging that's interesting to me is sometimes people do have a pretty good message. Um, but what I like to say is they start in the middle of the story. They start in the middle of the story. They 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 make the assumption that their uh, their their prospect will understand what they're saying, but they start in the middle of the story. They start talking about their product and their solution, just assuming that their customer is kind of grounded, um, you know, in kind of what they're talking about, you know. And I've actually been on sales pitches, listening in on you know some sales folks from customers, and you get to the end, and it's like, you even see them on Zoom, it's. I almost want to kick the salesperson if I could, if there was a way to do it. It's like that guy's a little bit wide-eyed, you know. Mm. He's not. He's he's nodding his head, or she's nodding her head. They are not understanding what I could tell, but from their body language, they are not understanding what you're saying. Because mm -hmm. by the way, and as soon as you give them that little tidbit, hey, what we're talking about is how um, you're doing X, Y, and Z today. Oh, okay. You need to give them that concept uh, context. So that's actually, again, that's that's kind of a big theme maybe for me here. We talked about that in the positioning. You need to ground it. We talked about, you know, it, it wasn't the automobile. It was the horseless carriage. You need to, it's grounded in context. Mm -hmm. um, you know, when, uh, you know, when, um, you know, the, you know, when e even Elon Musk, um, you know, brilliant, you know, they didn't just call it the, you know, they didn't just call it the, uh, the crazy moving, v you know, thing. They called it the electric car. It was, he still calls it an electric vehicle. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, so it, it, it's, 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 you know, it, absolutely a breakthrough and in, in distinction in our industry, but he's still trying to sell to car buyers, um, luxury car buyers in the electric car market. Now they're expanding that by the way. Mm -hmm. Um, but you know, you need to ground it in reality. Um, don't start in the middle, you know, don't start your story in the middle. Yeah. I mean, well, you know, just to touch on the car thing, they can expand, because people already know them for one specific thing, right? They're good with electric batteries. That's their thing, and so um, so then when they start to expand, uh, you know, into uh, solar panel arrays or something like that, it's a logical extension, and you can sort of say, "Oh yeah, I get it," because their brand sort of ties in around that main theme. But I think a lot of times that you know, smaller companies, and um, I think most people listening fall into that category are, are in the smaller company range. Uh, what are the other stumbling blocks? You know, so we've talked about a handful of them. What are some of the oversight stumbling blocks people make with their messaging? 
I think I think those are really the big ones. Um, yeah. Really, the three you know the, the ones that we talk with. Number one is you know the Swiss Army knife syndrome, trying to be all things to all people. Yeah. Um, um, and you, you know you just uh, really made a great point around that as well. I mean that is a huge problem. Um, and you made the point also, it doesn't mean you'll always be that maybe you, in the future, you can be a Swiss army knife, um, uh, or a little bit of a, I actually even understand Swiss army knife sales are going way down that literally I have read an article about that, but you know, but you, you can be maybe a little bit of a Swiss army knife. Maybe in the future, you can have a blade and a scissor and a saw. Um, but you got to start, you got to create a beachhead. One of my favorite all time books. And I know it's like date, definitely dating me, um, is crossing the chasm. Um, you know, I just, you know, you have to establish a beachhead. You have to figure out, you need to put all of your forces, if you will, behind that one beachhead, that one problem, that one message, everything needs to go behind it. You need to align your marketing, your salespeople, um, your marketing materials, your website, all need to be aligned a hundred percent behind that. And you have to have conviction and beat it down, um, until you're able to make progress through, establish those early customers, use that as, you know, and create testimonials from those early customers, have them telling your story now, that mm -hmm. message, using the power of telling that, that, you know, we're a blade and now customers are saying, yeah, they're a blade, they're the best blade there actually ever is. You, mm -hmm. you know, and this blade is, you know, you don't want to use it for, you know, for your steaks, but it's the best fruit blade there is in the marketplace. There's none other. Um, and you're the best fruit, fruit blade company in the world um, now, by the way, when you have, you know, a few dozen of those, okay, now actually let's go attack the, uh, the meat, the steak market, <laughs> um, with steak knife. You know, so like, so, you know, you might recall, I, I uh, ran a company called Mailer Mailer. We're an email marketing software company. And so our tagline was easy email marketing. I mean, that's just like right down to the T that's what we provided was just, we made that entire process so simple, drag and drop. But then I would talk to people. Uh, in a specific niche, it was the IT services industry, and they wouldn't sign up. I'm like, why are they not signing up? It's so simple to use. You know, the biggest response back I got, and I wouldn't have known this had I not talked to customers. They're like, well, I don't know what to send. You know, we've got this easy email marketing software thing, but you talk to certain markets and like, yeah, your tool is easy, but I have no idea what to send to people. So then I started digging deeper and deeper and deeper, and I realized that, hey, what if we created something for you to send? Because there's always trending topics. There's always some security breach. We could just talk about that as news. If we wrote articles for you, would that make your job easier? Oh my goodness, suddenly the head started to nod. So we ended up building uh, an add-on that was specifically designed for IT companies. So it became easy email marketing for IT companies including and it, we included content so literally they would walk in they would click a couple but oh i like that article i like that article and they clicked to select the article if they wanted they could edit it but then in a fraction of a second it would create a newsletter create a blog page all that kind of stuff for them automatically and now we got people signing up relatively quickly i charged a significant premium for that extra level of service but it made people's jobs so much easier and we, and you just really do it by focusing 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 we could have taken the product and we could have sold it to everybody under the sun but we focused just on one specific market that had a need because I'm like well why aren't they sending it out and they told me well we don't know what to send well what if i give you something to send oh yeah that'll make my job easier so that's what we built and then we could message it that way too you don't well, have to think. Well, that's how, one of the things I love about that story, that was that, first of all, great example, such a great example. The thing I love about that story, and, and I see this a lot myself, you're going out and doing that research and what have you. Don't be so stuck on what your product is exactly. I mean, no, essentially, you your product. Oh, God. Biggest lesson in the world. <laughs> essentially, yeah. what you did is you actually evolved your product to meet the customer's need. That wasn't mm -hmm. messy, right? Uh, by the way, you asked me another big stumbling block. One of the, frankly, a lot of times people bring me in and they say, we have a messaging problem. Um, it's actually the most frequent reason I do get brought in. Yeah. Um, yeah, but I, you know, I'm, I go in like a doctor. I'm not going to just, you know, start on a project without kind of really understanding the full on, you know, full what's going on. Mm -hmm. Sometimes it's, a, it's a sales problem. Sometimes it's a channels problem. Some frequently it's a product problem. Yeah, you don't have the right product. And by the way, and actually, what's interesting, and, and and you actually did this, is that through the research, you know, that you're doing about the message, the customer's telling you, yeah, it would be really great if you just could do this. Um, and so be ready to evolve you know, your product because listen, you could have the best message in the world, but if you don't have a product that delivers on that pain point that that customer is trying to solve, 
you're going to fail. Um, yes, you know. the, message, the message is going to get you in the door, but you're going to fail in the demo. You're going to fail in the in the proof of concept, or worse, you're going to fail um, after the purchase. Yeah, yeah. And with the messaging, you know, you're it, if if the product isn't so hot, or maybe the delivery isn't so hot, and and the executives want to fix it through messaging, that's it's only going to take you so far. You are putting lipstick on a pig at that point. But there's another there's another uh, you know layer to this. Um, the product research, you know, as you pivot your product or you, you realize that there's a need for, um, you know, when you do your blue ocean thinking, where, where is there a need? You got to get multiple people saying the same exact thing before you build anything. I've seen so many companies get data points from four customers, two customers, and they think, oh my God, customers want this. You know, and you try to peel back the uh, the layers of the onion. They're like, well, it's just a, you're salt. You're basically building a custom product for one guy who asked for one feature. <laughs> you know, yeah. and and so thinking that everybody wants it. You know, yeah, so, oh my God. By, by the way, this is this should be our next podcast together yeah. because I mean we're hitting on a whole other area, but that's a hundred percent true. And it goes back to your early original buyers are not the mainstream buyers, generally speaking. Um, I would say ninety percent plus of the time they're not your mainstream buyer. Mm -hmm. um, and that's one of the challenges that, that that's why, um, you know, a lot of folks have this challenge because they develop this great technology, this great product. It does solve a real problem. They're able to sell to that early market. Um, and, and, and they don't have to necessarily have the slickest messaging and product and all that. I have, I have another customer, um, you know, uh, well, a company I've been talking to, um, they have a product that frankly, they build it on top of Excel and Tableau mm -hmm. and they're blowing it out the door. Um, they're blowing it out the door because it's solving a need. They could, they, I mean, by the way, they're selling it to big Fortune 500. It's amazing what they're doing. Um, mm -hmm. I'm actually working with them now. I will hopefully we'll be working with them um, to kind of now really polish it all up. But frankly, they did it right. Um, mm -hmm. They started with almost basically a minimal viable product, but that the company that was so compelling that people were willing to buy it. Basically, an Excel spreadsheet on top of Tableau because they have some things in there. There's some magic in there that's amazing for these big banks. But, yeah. you know, but you, you know, to your point, though, is that you need to, um, you know, evolve that story. And then when you get to that next layer, you're trying to get to that mainstream. It might require not just a new message, but it might require some adjustments in how your product and, and frankly, through the messaging process, um, the beauty of the exercise is that that often comes back and I frequently come back. With, yeah, I'm not saying I, I don't, I, I don't, you know, never, it's, it's very rare that I'll come back and we just need to throw this out the door. I can tell you an anecdote about that, by the way, I got one, but um, mm -hmm. the, um, there is, but it does come back to, um, you know, we have to add these features. We have to position this a different way. Um, we have to go more narrow actually to go faster. We actually have to, and, and that seems counterintuitive to a lot of these, you know, to a lot of, um, you know, founders, we have to go narrower to go faster and bigger. Yeah. 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 And, and, you know, so to, to kind of like bring it all together, messaging is not just a two hour exercise where you sit down with a consultant and say, OK, come up with a new message for us. There's a lot of homework you got to do. There's a lot of deep thinking and and answering. I'm going to say sometimes uncomfortable questions that you don't want to be asked about your product because you sort of know, but you don't want it to come out, you know. And so those are the kinds of things that really if you want to create that brand that enables you to grow your company to the point where someone's going to want to buy you. Everybody wants to get bought out or go public if that's the case, you know, but more people want to get bought out than, you know, that's the dream. And the way you got to build it is you've got to create something that people understand. And you do that through talking to customers. You do that through focus. Uh, so those are some of the major steps in um, in getting your message uh, refined so your brand really can take off. Daniel, thank you so much. How can people reach you? Yeah. Um, best way to reach me is really through my website. Um, it's at danielheimlich.com. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe if you don't mind, could you drop that in the notes maybe in the... Uh I uh, will absolutely put it. In fact, it's in the description of the podcast. So people can just take a look, copy your name and just go to your name.com, danielheimlich.com. Um, there's so much depth to Daniel's knowledge about uh, messaging. He's done this for a lot of companies and has had, got tremendous expertise. I always learn something new when I talk to him and I look forward to having another conversation about future topics too. Daniel, thank you so much for joining us today. Man, it's been great. Thank you so much, Raj. All right. Take care.